Hi, everyone. I'm going to give it just a little bit of time for people to come in and get settled. Okay, well, great. Um, hi, my name is Susan Sullivan, as you can see from the screen there. Um, I'm a member of the admissions committee here at Columbia Business School. And today we're going to be giving an overview of our EMBA programs here at CBS and the application process. Um, I'm also joined by my colleague, Yasmin Kovacic, who's going to be managing the Q&A box, which you can see on your screen there. So throughout the presentation, um, she'll be answering any questions that you want to type in there, but there are a lot more of you than there are of her, so she may save some for later on. We're going to do um, a verbal Q&A at the end of the presentation. Also, I'm going to go into a lot of detail about the application process toward the end, so you might want to wait till we get there before you start asking those questions. So moving on, I am delighted to say that we have two recent alumni joining us today, Phoebe Chen and Austin Smith. So if each of you, let's start with you, Phoebe, could introduce yourself. Um, where are you from? Which EMBA program did you do? When did you graduate? And a little bit about your professional background and current um, company and role. Thanks, Susan. Hi, everyone. My name is Phoebe Chen. I'm originally from Texas and moved to New York about six years ago. So it was really nice to have the opportunity to go to school while living in the same city. My professional background has been mostly in consulting, management consulting. And then during my time at Columbia, I had the opportunity to pivot into strategy. So now I work for a company called Gartner and I lead our early career talent strategy globally for um, university and MBA recruiting. So it's a really exciting time. Um, to be in this industry. And yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing my experiences with all of you. Great, thanks. How about you, Austin? Hey, everybody. I, I grew up in Iowa um, and have been in New York since 2007. Uh, uh, also, in by Friday, Saturday, um, we were up in the same cluster here. Uh, and um, okay. uh, uh, yeah, I uh, run a boutique tech consulting firm. Uh, we um, I do implementation, strategy, design, um, tech transformation for uh, mostly for media companies. Um, uh, yeah, it's me. Great, thanks. Okay, so these are the topics we're going to touch on today. We'll talk about our philosophy of one Columbia MBA across all our programs and the different EMBA formats that we offer. We'll talk about community because Honestly, the people you meet, the relationships you build are, are such an important part of EMBA. And then we'll highlight some of the resources that we offer to help you make the most of the program. And then finally, next steps. That's where we'll focus on the actual application process. So one Columbia MBA, what do we mean by that? Well, I'm sure you know we have a full-time MBA program, but we also have several different EMBA options. But no matter which program you do, you're going to earn the same degree. The academic content for each is the same. You get the same core curriculum taught by the same faculty and access to the same electives. It's even the same number of classroom contact hours. You're going to graduate with the same degree regardless of program. Your diploma is going to say Master of Business Administration, Columbia University. And importantly, you're going to have access to the same Columbia Business School alumni network when you graduate. The difference between EMBA and full-time is the time formats in which they're offered. EMBA students are required to remain employed throughout the program, so their classes are offered on the weekends or in block weeks so they can complete their degrees without interrupting their career momentum. Okay, I do want to touch briefly on, you know, every 10 years or so, the school, the faculty reevaluates what is it that Columbia Business School should be focusing on? How do we best equip our students to lead in a, a rapidly changing world? And these are the points that our current Dean, Costis Maglaras, feels are really important for us to, to focus on. Um, there's a picture of our new campus in Manhattanville, which reflects our school's vision of um, business leadership for the future. You know, AI, chat GBT, the climate, crisis. Um, these are the things all of our curriculum is trying to grapple with. It's what we think about when we're hiring faculty. Um, hopefully it's what our students are 
ready to grapple with when they graduate. Um, sort of backing up a little bit, Phoebe and Austin, could you briefly elevator pitch, tell us why you chose CBS EMBA? Let's start with you, Austin. Sure, yeah, for me, it was a really easy decision. Um, my camera's acting up for some reason, sorry about that. Uh, um, I, I, I live very near Columbia, uh, the main campus, which is where we started uh, in, in 2020. And um, we're the first class to graduate from uh, the, the new campus where we only spent a semester. Um, and it was like the very beginning of the pandemic. My uh, business school is something that I'd always wanted to do. Uh, you know, I had my business travel basically fell off, a, uh, totally fell off a cliff. So I, I found myself with like a third of my time just given back to me um, and uh, seize the opportunity. Uh, I completed my application on the very last day of the cycle. Don't do that. Um, I don't think it'll work as well in non-pandemic non years. <laughs> um, but the, uh, 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 yeah, for me really like as a way to, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, I started my own company. I've, I've run my company since 2010 um, and as a way to broaden my network and connect with new people, uh, this camera is not going to stay. Um, I'll fix it in a second. Um, it looks fine. That, uh, uh, sorry? Oh, just saying you look okay. You're just frozen. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, that, uh, 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 yeah, expanding my network, um, you know, broadening my horizons outside my subject matter, um, learning finance, learning accounting, all these things that, um, I had kind of gotten a little bit by exposure, uh, but kind of starting from uh, a position of um, just like, I, I, I really want to learn this stuff. I really want to get this stuff done. And um, it worked great. I learned a ton and I have you know, hundreds of new friends. Which is awesome. <laughs> That's great. How about you, Phoebe? Yeah, I would say similar to Austin, you know, during the pandemic, I found that I traveled a lot less for consulting. So it was a really great opportunity to be able to still maintain my career while going back to school. And I chose Columbia for the reason that I was already living in New York City and it was a way for me to maintain the life that I had without uprooting myself to go to a new program. Um, I will say that I also applied on the last day and I agree that I shouldn't recommend that, but you know, sometimes things just work out well for everyone. <laughs> Did you apply anywhere else? I'm, I'm curious. I, I didn't. I didn't either. I was just like, you know what? I'm ready to go back to business school. And the dates worked out that Columbia was available for an application. <laughs> it was like, or oh, bus. Cool. Was my we're, yeah. we're glad you both submitted whenever it was you submitted. <laughs> I'm sorry, Susan. Everyone should apply in the next month so they can get it there in early. Yes. Okay. Hold on. Why? There we go. Oh, no. Okay. So um, shifting gears, I'm sure one of the reasons that the people who are viewing today are thinking about embers because you want to you want to learn you want to deepen and broaden your knowledge of business and obviously a key factor in the quality of your education is going to be the quality of the people teaching mentoring you and we're we're really proud of our faculty here we have an amazing group of 144 full-time research faculty members. These are the people with PhDs doing that cutting edge research, real thought leaders uh, in their various disciplines. And I would say a characteristic of our faculty is that they focus on real world applications, not just theory. That's a big part of why they're here at Columbia in New York City. It's, it's a living laboratory for everything they're researching. So they're very connected to the local and global business communities. And that really colors what they bring to the classroom experience. Um, one other thing I want to point out up in the corner there, 25 executives and residents. These are people who um, some teach, most do not. They are retired or semi-retired C-suite level executives who basically volunteer their time to act as sort of guidance counselors to our students. Um, 
couple of examples, Bob Esner, the retired CEO of Wyeth, uh, Pauline Brown, former chairman of North America for LBMH. These are people who have this 30,000 foot view of their industries that you can just book time with to talk about the industry that you're interested in, get um, really ask them whatever questions you have. It's an example of the kind of access that's available here at Columbia. Now this slide, the point here, um, a real differentiator for Columbia Business School is that more than half of our faculty, another 205 on top of the 144 research faculty, these are people that we call adjunct practitioners. They are not academics. They're working full time in a variety of industries. And you know, we're lucky because of our location, but also the strength of our brand, the quality of our students makes them really eager to teach here at Columbia and to engage with the next generation of business leaders. Um, the opportunity to be exposed to both these kinds of faculty members, top researchers and practitioners, really makes CBS an exciting place to learn about business. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot we won't say favorite, but if you can name a professor, talk a little bit about someone who had an impact on you, um, who wants to start? I can chime in. Um, you know, one professor that I really enjoyed was Stefan Meyer. He taught strategy both for a foundation strategy class, and I see Austin nodding his head. He was just really great and interactive, especially we both started during right when the pandemic happened. So getting to be in person with a professor so dynamic was great. He did teach a class at the end of our um, time at Columbia that was the future of work, and that has just been really relevant especially with the fifth pillar of, you know, the role of business in society and the way we're thinking about future work, being remote and hybrid. So um, I would I would probably say Stefan was in the top, but I won't say favorite. <laughs> How about you, Austin? Yeah, I, I have um, um, also, I would say no, no single favorite, um, but a, a, you know, good, like, eight or 10 that I, I feel like I couldn't have gone through business school without having met. Uh, one that um, I want to call it in particular uh, was on, this photo was on the faculty slide that you had is uh, Shiva Rajkopal, everyone calls him Shiva. Uh, mm -hmm. Such a nice guy. And um, um, I, I had him in my second semester. Uh, I exempted corporate finance, um, which uh, I, yeah, if, if you've got a finance, I didn't have a finance background. I taught it to myself um, so that I could take an extra elective. Um, but it's it, you can exempt a handful of core classes to expand the number of electives that you take. Um, and I I took um, his class uh, about fundamental analysis, uh, which was the one of the hardest classes I've ever taken anywhere with you know pretty major workload. Um, things that I just had no experience with. People in the class were finance professionals or, you know, there were some full-time MBA students that were preparing to, you know, to go be analysts or investment bankers. Um, and so it was really like trial by fire. Uh, but the tools I got in that class, I actually find myself using all the time, um, you know, to learn about my clients, my competition, um, it's just the, the tools I got from that class and the patient way that he explained them, um, I found, I found extremely, extremely helpful. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, well, obviously our location also makes it incredibly easy for students to gain exposure to the wider business community and hear from a, a broad range of high profile guest speakers um, through conferences, speaker series, both at the business school and the wider university. And it, probably the way most executive MBA students uh, are exposed to speakers is in the classroom itself. Uh, lots of our faculty will bring in speakers to the class. Um, Gosh, an example this week with the UN General Assembly in town uh, here at Columbia, we sponsor the World Leaders Forum and right next door to our office, we're going to have the president of Chile speaking. Um, yeah. Were there any speakers that either of you, that stood out for either of you? I see you nodding your head. 
Yeah. Um, a number, a number of speakers, and and this is silly, but I can't remember this. I, I remember his job, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't remember um, his name. And which is, I'm, I'm, I'm googling it. Uh, the um, I was the CEO of of, uh, of HEB, which is the one of the largest privately held um, supermarkets in the country, and um, just hearing about the way that HEB, I don't know if any of you listening know um, about HEB, but they're uh, primarily in Texas, um, but they are um, extremely popular within Texas. Uh, you and my my family is is um, originally original. I'm, I I never lived in Texas. My family is originally from there, um, and everyone who knows HEB knows that they have just a tremendous amount of like community impact. So every time there's a hurricane, they roll out trucks with grills and refrigerators and hearing about how he bridges, um, you know, uh, uh, impact and the bottom line or, or, you know, corporate social responsibility. I thought that was really valuable. And, um, you know, every time we heard a, a guest speaker that has a, a job like that, yeah, it just sort of served to remind us that there are no, you know, there are no secret, there, there are no no secret tricks. There's no magic. It's just like you know, doing the right thing every day. Uh, so I thought that was, I thought that was super cool. Great, thanks. Um, okay, let's talk about the logistics of how the EMBA programs work. You all have busy lives and different scheduling needs, so we offer a few different options. Uh, here you can see our EMBA New York program has two different paths. Um, you can see, let's see, the dark blue column for EMBA Friday, Saturday. The way that works is it, it begins each year in August and students meet all day Friday and all day Saturday, every other week. Um, for that one, when you're applying, you do, do need to provide a letter from your company confirming time sponsorship. Um, financial sponsorship would be great. We don't require that. We do require that they say, yes, you can have Fridays off so that you can come to classes. Um, Friday Saturday program is five terms in length over 20 months and students take four courses each term. Now in the first two terms, that's when you're taking the core curriculum. There's a five day residency period at the start of the term. This takes place off campus, uh, accommodations are provided. And what it consists of is you're taking classes all day, you're, you're doing group work and there are social events with your cluster and learning team. Um, it really gets you back in that student mindset and lays the foundation for building your EMBA network. Now, if we move to the yellow column for EMBA Saturday, that one starts in May each year and students meet all day Saturday, basically every week, not holiday weekends and there are breaks in between terms, but it's basically every Saturday all day. Uh, for that one, you do not need a time sponsorship letter because hopefully you have Saturdays off. Um, it is six terms in length over 24 months. It's a little bit longer than Friday, Saturday, excuse me, because generally you're taking only three classes per term. Now, the core curriculum for the Saturday program extends over the first three terms, and there's a short residency period of three days, Friday, Saturday, and part of Sunday, at the start of those first three terms. Again, it's off campus, accommodations are provided. So uh, you both did Friday, Saturday. I'm curious, uh, Phoebe, what, why, what led to you choosing that time format? For me, I really liked having every other weekend to myself. So Friday, Saturday gave me that opportunity. And because for my the nature of my job, even prior to the pandemic, Fridays were always a little bit quieter for us. So it was an easier ask for my employer to allow me to work. Um, Monday to Thursday, and then of course, just do some catch up on Friday. I will say that it was nice, Susan, I'm not sure if it was during the pandemic, but Austin, you know, we had a really good opportunity to connect with the Saturday class anyway, even though we were just Friday, Saturday. So all of the programs really um, have an opportunity to be exposed to each other. Yeah, right. I mean, the the basic hurdle for someone doing Friday, Saturday is whether or not your company will allow you to have Fridays off. So that's step one. But beyond that, it's thinking about what works best for your own personal schedule, your own personal way that you tend to learn best. Um, but 
after the core curriculum, you're sort of all together anyway. So you will be exposed to both groups. Um, let's see, here is a graphic for Friday, Saturday. Nope, this is Saturday. Here's Friday, Saturday, um, showing when you're taking the core, which is the blue, and when you're taking elective, which is the yellow. You see the program's five terms long. You take four courses each term. Um, as Austin mentioned, we do have a required core curriculum. Uh, the core courses cover all those foundational business knowledge needs for an effective leader. Um, but if you have a strong background in accounting, statistics, or corporate finance, you can take an exemption exam to pass out of those classes. Uh, it does not lessen the total number of credits you take, but it allows you to take electives in their place. And Excuse me. Each year we bring in about 120 Friday, Saturday students in August, and we split the class into two clusters of roughly 60 each. And you take all of your core classes with that same cluster, so you really get to know them well and, and form strong bonds. Um, but then we further break the cluster down into learning teams of five or six people that you'll do about half of your core course assignments with. We make sure each um, learning team has a variety of nationalities, industries, test scores. We really want each student to get that diversity of perspectives. And um, here's the Saturday program, six terms long, usually taking three courses, uh, core courses in the first three terms, electives in the last three. For Saturday, we aim to bring in about 100 students, uh, two clusters of roughly 50 each. Um, another important thing for you to know, regardless of which program you do, is that during the core, you have to stay in the time format of that program you're admitted into because you're working in teams. You need to be there at the same time. But once you're in the elective terms, you've got total flexibility. If you want to continue in the same time format, great. If you want to switch from Friday, Saturday to Saturday or vice versa, take a few evening courses or maybe a block week course, that's fine too. It's entirely up to you. Um, Austin, could you talk a little bit about uh, working together in a learning team. I think people often wonder about how much time it takes in between classes, um, how you, you know, divvy up the work amongst your, what's it like to be with a learning team? Yeah, um, I think that's, you know, one of the most important experiences in the program. And, and for a lot of people, that's like sort of forms the, the nucleus of the the social bonds that we, we made in the um in, in the program during core, um, <clears throat> I I think we would meet one night a week, but we'd meet like three or four hours sometimes. Um, people could come in or out as they needed, um, uh, based on what they were contributing or what they wanted to contribute. Uh, it's I think easy to fall into a trap that I saw some some teams do this of letting you know, letting the CPA carry the water during accounting and letting the corporate finance people handle corporate the corporate finance stuff. That's not always the best idea just because you get assessed individually. So um, for me, it was just a really like fun experience. It wasn't, there was no really no stress to being in a team format. We never pitted against each other. Um, there are some like really fun deliverables that are, are, that are cool to do as a team. Like we had a great time doing a marketing project together. Um, yeah, I I think it's you know one of absolutely one of the highlights of the program overall. Uh, I would also just say like the um, even with the the time I mentioned with the learning team, I didn't find the amount of work between the weekends to be um, too terribly onerous. Um, yeah, it depends. I think a little bit on on. Um, quantitative skills coming in. Uh, the people that had more work to do on that, I think, had to spend a lot longer on some of the subjects because core is 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 pretty quantitative. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I think I've heard people say, you know, expect an average of 15, 20 hours of homework a week, but it's really going to vary depending on how comfortable you are with the quant homework. Um, I've had ballerinas that we've admitted who spent a lot of time doing their quant homework. And then people who are, you know, doing financial models for their job sort of whiz through it. But that's part of what the learning team is for. You help 
each other get through and learn from each other. And that's part of what the core is for also, is to get everyone up to at least a basic level of being able to handle all of those. So um, thank you. Moving forward, I also want to briefly mention our EMBA Global Program. This is a partnership program with London Business School. I won't go into much detail. We will be doing a webinar on this program November 16. Um, but basically, uh, classes are offered in a block week format, which means you take a week off from work each month to do this. Um, students attend classes one week each month over the course of 20 months and alternate between Columbia Business School one month and London Business School the next month. Um, and if you have questions about this, send us an email. We're happy to answer all your questions. Okay, electives. The point I want to make here is that you really have total flexibility during the elective terms, not just in terms of the time format, but also the courses. We don't have majors or concentrations. You can choose whatever electives interest you and are relevant to your goals. Um, this is just a really small sample of our electives. We offer over 340 of them across 14 different academic areas. And this is another I think key differentiator for Columbia Business School, not all EMBA programs offer this level of variety and, and flexibility. Um, just like I asked about favorite professors, do you have a favorite or high impact elective you wanna uh, share about? Phoebe, how about you? Susan, I was looking at this list and realizing that I only took one of the electives listed, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> There are so many, like you said, there's, you know, over 300 and I, in the last semester, took a negotiations class and that was really great because we just were really able to look at not only negotiations from a business perspective, but also how do we apply that in everyday life. And there were so many great exercises to be able to try out, even just negotiating, you know, a free membership somewhere. Um, so it was really great to, to be able to take a negotiations class um, but probably just one of many electives that I enjoyed during my time. How about you, Austin? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I took a, a handful on here. Um, I, I really enjoyed M&A and I also really enjoyed seminar and value, and value investing. Um, I, I really consciously tried not to take electives that were too close to what I do for work. Um, I, I consider, I, from my perspective, like what I was going for was breadth and not depth necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. Although there are some areas where you could get a lot of depth, even if you've been working in the field um, for a long time. Uh, uh, but, you know, learning, learning how, how deals are structured uh, and, um, you know, deal rationale uh, was A, super interesting and B, more applicable than, um, than, I, than I thought it would be uh, by far. I would also just underscore something that, that Susan said about the um, variety. I, I think this is um, one of the most important things about EMBA at CBS. I think it's the largest EMBA program like anywhere, right? right. Um, and the like no one else gets this variety. You know, I've, I've, I've known folks at other like really highly ranked EMBA programs who had to go through a sort of no choice program where where there are no electives, everyone's doing the same thing. Maybe there are some advantages to that for some people, um, but being able to sort of choose your own adventure, um, I think is really cool because you know the the world of business doesn't boil down to any any twenty four classes. You need you need yeah. a lot of um, I think I think you need a lot of flexibility. And just for both of you to know, um, we also have a, a benefit for alums where you can um, audit classes for free. Uh, obviously, enrolled students have top priority, but if there's something you want to take that you couldn't fit in while you're a student, or you know maybe it's something new that you want to learn about for your job, um, if there is a seat available, alums can certainly do that for free. We also offer, um, there's a recorded uh, uh, version of some of our most popular classes uh, that we release to alums on this program called Alumni Edge. So if you're interested, let me know. 
And I think um, one of the other great things about electives is you get exposure to great professors and core, uh, but some of the electives are taught by executives in the industry. So in addition to the entrepreneurs and residents or the executives and residents, you, you can get direct exposure to industry insights when you take an elective with them. So that was also a really great experience. Yeah, good point. Um, oh, this is actually my favorite aspect of the program or dynamic supportive community. Um, I have mentioned how we structure the classes around clusters and learning teams to, to really foster relationships and help you gain a solid network here. Um, that's a real differentiator as well. Some, some EMBA programs are what are called part-time programs, which means you can really pop in and out depending on your schedule. And, and you know, that's a valid way to do it. It's some people, that's how they need to do it. Um, but we really feel that the uh, one of the added things about our EMBA is that you come in as a cohort and you really get that same network that you would get in a full-time program um, because it's designed for you to go through it together. There is flexibility if needed, but I think it's sort of the best of both worlds. Um, Phoebe and Austin, can you talk about what were your expectations in terms of a sense of community here? Were you surprised by what you found? Um, and maybe one of you could talk about CBS Matters, describe what that is. I'll start. Uh, I, my, I mean, my expectations were that I would, um, I was doing this in large part to broaden my network and make a bunch of new friends. And, um, you know, mission accomplished on both counts, no question. Uh, CBS Matters is um, a, uh, I guess just to, to re rewind, I'd say it exceeded my expectations because, you know, I, I, I knew that I was getting a learning team, that's six. I knew I was getting a cluster, that's 70. My program or the 60 or whatever it was, um, our program was 130 or 140 that year, but CBS as a whole is big and you're not really constrained to your lane. Like, like Phoebe mentioned, we got to mix with Saturdays later in the program. We got to mix with globals during block week. Um, we got to mix with full-time MBAs during, you know, some of us took full-time electives. Um, some of them took EMBA electives. Uh, so the, um, you know the the diversity and and magnitude of uh, my network. I, I would say grew way more way more than I expected. Uh, CBS Matters in particular is a really neat tradition at at CBS that I don't think has an um, even. It's just something that that the students have always done. I don't I don't think it's an official part of the school, right? Uh, but it is a program um, where uh, you can essentially elect to give a 15 minute, um, 10 or 15 minute, depending on the the, the, the cluster rules, uh, um, explanation to your friends and colleagues, like literally what matters to you. And it can be about anything. Um, I, I, I did one uh, and, and it was, it was really meaningful. I got a lot out of it and, um, it brought me closer to, uh, you know, the people that the people that came to listen. It was very cool. Yeah, and I think that's what's so great about CBS is there's so many ways to get connected to the community and um, have your own personal experience. You know, for me, I joined some of the clubs as well. So I was, I joined um, Asian Business Association and I was able to connect with a lot of full-time MBAs as well in that program. And I remember during the pandemic, there was a focus on diversity and the Dean's office worked with us to put on a panel where we were able to bring in, you know, alumni like Agnes Chu, who's the CEO of Condé Nast and just be able to create a shared experience and a community within the student membership um, to talk through what's even going on in the macro and microeconomic climate. So I would say there's a really great way to make friends every day in the class, but then also a great way when you branch out and connect to the other members of the MBA class as well. Great, thank you. Um, this is usually a highlight of the program, except maybe for people who entered during the pandemic. Um, 
We usually require that each EMBA uh, student completes at least one international seminar during the program. Uh, it's a real bonding experience for students. Um, students travel with a professor to another country where they spend a week focusing on a topic relevant to that destination. For example, um, there's one on entrepreneurship in South Africa, um, one on emerging markets in Buenos Aires, tech startups in Tel Aviv. Uh, there's one on experience branding in Munich that takes place during Oktoberfest. Um, like I said, it's, it's yes, it's educational, but it's really fun and um, a real bonding experience. There are usually six or seven to choose from in a given term. Uh, the day is going to consist of morning classes and then afternoon company site visits and guest speakers, and of course, social and cultural events in the evening. Uh, the most recent addition to the roster was Morocco, is Morocco, with uh, a gateway to the African market theme. Um, uh, let's see, accommodations are provided, it's included in your tuition, uh, but students do pay their own transportation costs. And you can do more than one, but if you if you do a second one or a third one, uh, there is a fee involved. So moving forward, as Austin said, ours is the largest EMBA program in the country, uh, which offers a lot of benefits for you. Probably the main one is that we have such a large number and wide range of elective courses. But, you know, another benefit is this vast lifelong network of alumni. Um, this, I mean, I guess that's an odd picture. If you grew up in New York or you have kids, you will recognize the uh, Museum of Natural History's Hall of Ocean Life. Um, this is one of our galas. There are large, uh, you know, events like this that the school uh, hosts for students and alumni. Um, but also, uh, we didn't really mention that each of the clusters elects representatives for various things. There's a, there's a social rep who organizes social events for the cluster. There's, you know, an academics rep, a careers rep. So um, there are opportunities to, for leadership. There are opportunities to arrange all sorts of uh, connections outside of the classroom. And here we are. We're going to talk about some other resources outside the classroom. Um, obviously, another important reason for pursuing an MBA is to invest in your career. And we have an excellent career management center. Um, they call it the CMC, which is a team of professionals who work exclusively with the EMBA population because your needs in terms of career development are going to be different than those of our full-time MBA candidates who are usually going into industry um, in, you know, at an entry level. Um, yeah. I think Phoebe, you you utilize the CMC, right? Could you talk a little bit about your experience? Yeah, I did use them. Um, I had a really great experience because they do a lot of custom work with you. So you can schedule one-on-ones with the CMC coaches, and then they'll also create mock interview sessions for you to practice with your peers as you're prepping for an interview. But I think the best takeaway from that experience was how much they cared about the process for each student. So they really took the time to comb through your resume for you and then helped you think about, you know, where do you want to take your career, not just what makes the most sense based on your resume. Yeah, yeah. And I, I should point out that in general, EMBA students are already on the path toward their target career and they're, they're focused more on um, long-term career advancement rather than a big 180 degree career switch. Um, EMBA is not really designed for those huge changes of both industry and function. That kind of change can be difficult because you're required to work full time through the program and you can't, there's no opportunity to do an internship. So um, if you are looking to switch into investment banking or one of the, the top consulting firms and you don't have a background in that, we should probably talk. Full-time might be a better choice for you. But that being said, we do see tons of EMBA students pivot. Well, like Phoebe, make unexpected changes <laughs> because they're suddenly exposed to new ideas, new people. Um, and a lot of opportunities are going to come your way largely because of your classmates. They can be one of your best resources. Um, they 
are doing something you never really thought about that's interesting. They are either in a hiring position or they know what their company's needs are. So that kind of network, in addition to the support of the CMC, um, can really be helpful. So let's see, what else? Ah, yes specialized personal attention we know how busy you are already and then once you get into this program between work school and your personal life you are very busy so we've got resources to help make things go smoothly um, there's a staff member that you can contact to help with whatever it is you know whether it's a registration issue or a billing issue or just questions about i don't know whatever there's someone there to guide you um textbook delivery catered meals breakfast lunch snacks um tutoring we didn't really talk about that but people are coming in with different levels of basic knowledge in the core so we we want to set you up to succeed we offer uh up to 45 hours free tutoring and the quantitative core courses but if you team up with it with a partner you can get up to 90 basically whatever tutoring you need is there and of course, tech support. There is always someone there if your laptop blows up. Hopefully that never happens to you. Um, alumni network. This is something I really didn't appreciate the importance of until I started doing admissions. But your network is not just the people in your own class. Um, you know, as Austin pointed out, it's, it's going to stretch out over the other programs, over other years. Uh, right now we have, what, 49,000 CBS alums and still growing all over the world, every industry you can imagine. So when choosing a school, you wanna think about the lifelong community you'll be joining, um, their level of achievement and their level of engagement. And, and I, I can say from my heart, um, Columbia Business School alums score high on both of those counts. Okay, next steps. We are going to focus now on the application process itself. Um, Austin, Phoebe, if you want to get a drink of water or whatever, you can have a little break for now um, and then come back and, and we'll probably have some questions for you. Um, okay, what we look for. The application for both Saturday and Friday, Saturday uh, for 2024 entry is live on our website now. So feel free to open it up, take a look. Um, when we are reviewing applications, we do a holistic review. There are no, no quotas, no cutoffs, no minimums. We're really going to evaluate you within the context of your own particular background. Um, academics. These are the things we are basically looking at. Academics. It is a rigorous program, so we want to make sure that you can handle the curriculum. Uh, to evaluate that, we ask you to provide unofficial transcripts with the application. Um, if you're admitted, we would then need official, but for the purpose of the application, unofficial transcript you, you download from your school website is fine. Uh, we do require a test. But there are three options, either the GMAT, the GRE, or the executive assessment. We don't do waivers. You have to do one of the tests. But we honestly have no preference between those. So do the one you're comfortable with. Um, da, 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 da. Let's see. Professional accomplishments. Um, we are looking for people with demonstrated leadership potential, people with ambitious ideas who have shown initiative and had an impact in their workplace. And to help us gauge that, we ask you to provide a professional resume. Um, on that, we're looking for career growth. That can mean promotions or simply additional responsibility. Um, for EMBA, we do expect our EMBA students to have had some form of management experience. But we have a pretty broad um, definition of that. It might mean managing people, but it can also mean managing processes or, or budgets or, or even projects. But we look for them to have some sort of decision-making role. Uh, we require one recommendation. We do prefer to get it from your current supervisor if possible, but um, you know sometimes that's not the best choice. Maybe you've only been working with that person a short time, um, so it's fine to not use your current 
supervisor, but we do ask you just to explain why. Um, other good choices are previous supervisors or maybe someone who's not your boss, but they supervised you on a project. Um, basically someone who knows you really well in a professional setting, someone to whom you've been accountable um, rather than a peer recommendation, that's not very helpful. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, uh, maybe a client would be a good recommender or a vendor or if you have board members or a business partner, that's also fine. Um, if you're in a family business, we don't want mom or dad to write it. So choose someone who's not related to you. And um, the title is not, their title is not important. What's really important is that they know you well, can provide a detailed assessment of your performance and potential. Uh, there are essays. Essay one, what do you see yourself doing professionally in the next three to five years? And what's your long-term dream job? Essay two, we ask you to describe a professional situation where you faced a challenge. Um, tell us what the outcome was and, and what you learned from that experience. Uh, so once you've done all of this and it's submitted, your recommendation has come in, the application is complete, you will hear from us within six weeks uh, regarding whether you're being invited to interview. Six weeks is the maximum. It, it can be much shorter than that. It really depends on workflow at the time. Um, but Within six weeks, you'll definitely hear. We do interview everyone that we're considering uh, admitting. The interview uh, usually takes place virtually and it's done by an EMBA alumni, alumnus. Uh, the alum will not have read your application. You will send them a copy of your resume and um, it's, it's a rather casual conversation. They'll ask you to walk them through your career path so far, talk about your future goals and why you wanna do an EMBA at CBS. Uh, basically, they're trying to get a sense of you as a person and, and your cultural fit with CBS. Does the EMBA program make sense for you? Do they think that you would fit here? And then within two weeks of the interview, you'll receive a final decision regarding admission. So usually, once you've submitted and it's complete, you'll have an answer. The whole thing should take maybe eight to 10 weeks maximum. Uh, here, you will see the application deadlines. These are all listed on our website, so you don't need to write them down. Um, you'll see that uh, we do have early and regular decision. Early decision is only if you're 100% sure you want Columbia, because if you're admitted early decision, you're agreeing to withdraw any other applications elsewhere and enroll here. Um, great. But if you're applying to several schools and you might be happy attending any of them, then apply regular decision. We have no negative association with that. It's, it's a smart thing to do. So, you know, choose whichever is right for you. But the important thing to know about our process is that we, we admit on a rolling basis. And what that means is instead of waiting for the deadline to look at all the applications at one time, we're reviewing them individually as they come in. So we're filling the class as we go. So in that scenario, it's always to your advantage to apply as early in the cycle as possible when we still have lots of spots available. So I hope I have left enough time for questions. Um, Yasmin, do you have any questions? from the audience for the students or for me? Yes, um, certainly do. Um, I was wondering if Austin or Phoebe, well, there's a couple questions around how intense the classes and programs are and if um, kind of the questions came around whether you can expect it to be a bit more intense later on in the program versus the core um, portion of the curriculum. So maybe you guys can just speak a little bit to that in general, you know, how um, demanding and, and, and difficult it is at different portions of the program, core curriculum and electives. Or when did you feel most stressed? <laughs> Most stressed uh, term to a core, I would say. What do you think, Phoebe? I agree. I think you're also getting used to taking back-to-back -back three classes that are three hours each. So it is just a mental exercise. Um, but they're not too intensive, I don't think. I think it gives you the exposure you need to the content. But like Austin said, even with our learning teams, you know, you meet once a week and, and that should be sufficient time for you to be able to finish most of the work um, on top of your own personal life and, and work responsibilities. Yeah, I, 
I, I would just underscore like the the difference between core and electives um, is massive. <laughs> like, I can't, almost can't overstate it. Like I, I thought term two of core was the worst because in term one of core on the Friday Saturday schedule, um, you know it's new. Everything's like exciting. Um, it's the first time you've done anything. By the time you're doing it in term two, it's not new anymore, <laughs> but it's still difficult. And um, um, in, in all of core, you know, the, the grading is more rigorous. The number of assignment, there are more assignments. There's every class has a midterm <laughs> and a final, um, or almost every class does. Um, but then once you get to electives, uh, you know, it's, no one's telling you what to do anymore. You can take you can take different kinds of classes. Classes might be one out of ten hard or ten out of ten hard, but you'll kind of know in advance. So if you're not up for, you can get through the whole program only taking easy electives and and have um, and just have a great time. I know plenty of people yeah. that did that, but everybody's got to go through core. So that's I think kind of what makes it the um, an, an, an intense piece of it. Yeah. Great. And kind of staying on the electives topic, um, there was a question around whether every elective is offered at every term. Um, the answer to that is no, right? It'll vary based on a variety of factors, um, faculty availability for once, you know, for one. Um, but maybe you guys can speak a little bit to, um, you know, whether you were able to take the classes you were hoping to take and if you had any kind of strategy during the elective portion of the program um, that helped you make sure you were, you managed to take what you were interested in? Yeah, I, I didn't find it very difficult to take the electives I wanted to take. I think the school did a great job of offering, even if something wasn't available this semester, because there's five terms or six terms of year in Saturday, you can get it maybe not the next semester, but then the semester after that. So just kind of being mindful of what's available during the full time that you're at the program, not just the semester you're signing up for electives is helpful. Um, and Susan, Yasmin, I don't know if it was a pandemic thing, but we were able to take full-time electives as well. Um, so that was a great opportunity to take a similar class if the elective I wanted during the mm -hmm. Friday, Saturday or the Saturday Ember program wasn't available. Yeah, I yeah, think that's, yeah, this is another, one of the great things about EMBA over the full-time program is that um, full-timers um, have a harder time getting all of the classes that they want, where, you know, most of the sort of like greatest hits of CBS are programmed on the EMBA schedule, and there are just fewer of us competing for, um, competing for the seat. So I, the other thing for me um, and, and some, some people I knew, so exempting classes in core, at least when we were there, the bid point, you 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 essentially bid on electives. And if, if you take electives in core, um, you start with more points and then you just get more of what you want. So that worked in my favor in particular. Um, it might be a reason to consider exempting some things in core if you, um, if you can. Um, but I, I think most people... Honestly, I don't know of anyone who is just like, who's still frustrated that they didn't get to take X, Y, or Z class. The people that wanted to do it badly enough waitlisted and went to the first day and ultimately, um, I think for the most part, they got to do it. Maybe there is a case here and there where it just didn't work out, um, but that's think, few and far between for this. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think there probably, was more flexibility during if during when we were required to be online because of the pandemic. But currently, just to answer that, um, there are some classes that are cross-listed between program between programs. And then if there's a class in the full-time schedule that is not being offered in the EMBA schedule that an EMBA student wants to take, they can work with their academic advisor to request to, to, to register for that. So there are ways, but likely it was probably easier when everything was online and there were no limits to actual physical seats, <laughs> I imagine. Um, no, they limited us. No, they, the, oh, um, did they? Yeah, and we were... Um, in our, we were, we were required to be in person for our last two terms, which is when most of our electives took okay. place. So it was, I think it was pretty similar. I, I think the way that it works, there were like, like three to five seats per full-time class that EMBAs could list for. Um, but there are so many full-time classes. So mm -hmm. like you're, you're, 
chances aren't very good that you're competing with other Embas for, you're more like competing with your work schedule because full-time classes <laughs> occur during the work day. That's right. Um, yeah. Um, and kind of staying with the topic of classes and workload and all of that, there was a question around whether you had to submit assignments virtually or online between classes um, or was all the kind of, maybe you can speak a bit more generally about what kind of work did you have to do in between classes um, during the days that you were not on campus with your group? I think for corporate finance, we did some case more. studies. So that was something we got together during the week to manage, but it's a question just around how difficult the assignment was or how much time it took. I, I guess we did submit the homework virtually because we were we were in a pandemic. And so most of it was just, you know, we shared Google Docs and PowerPoint presentations and then ultimately um, provided the document through like a SharePoint like website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think basically every assignment hand in is is done mm -hmm. on Canvas, which mm -hmm. is the the learning system. Um, I, I bet that's still true. I, I bet that they're not printing out papers or or whatever. Um, but yeah, there, there there certainly were deliverable due dates between classes, but I don't think it was ever like you'd have class on Friday and then there would be something due. Like you, you'd have more notice than just like four or five days. But yeah, I think in, especially in core, there were cases where there might be a relatively tight turnaround. Um, but again, no, no, no surprises. It's it's all like in the syllabus. So if if you need to make plans, um, you you make you make plans. But I don't think the due dates almost ever perfectly lined up with with when the classes were. But I don't I don't remember it being a, a problem. Mm -hmm. um, Susan, there was a question here around um, the differences in terms of class profile between Saturday and Friday, Saturday cluster um, clusters. Do you want to speak to that a little bit from the admissions perspective, if there are any? Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. I would say that Saturday might be might contain a student population that is a slightly earlier career than Friday, Saturday, um, mostly because they're just not senior enough to get Fridays off. Um, but honestly, I think if you sat in one and sat in the other, you wouldn't really feel a big difference. It's, I think, you know, I was actually looking at the numbers the other day and it was like a year and a half difference in terms of age. So I don't think it's that much of a difference, um, but it's, that's kind of the biggest difference that I see. I think when you are applying, it's really more about um, what time format works for you. Can you get Fridays off? Actually, we're finding more people because of hybrid work situations, finding that Friday, Saturday does work for them. It's it's less of a, a problem getting that permission from their their uh, employers. Um, but, you know, do you have um, children or an active social life where you want to have every other weekend free and not have to go to class? That's something to think about. Um, I think a big thing to think about is the workload because Saturdays are doing three classes per term, where Friday, Saturdays are doing four classes per term. So what's happening in your job in that year that you're gonna be in the program? Um, you know, how much bandwidth do you have? And also another thing to think about is how do you learn best? Um, you know, some people really like having that weekend off in between to sort of absorb and, you know, spread out their, their time to learn what they, had in class the week before. Um, I've had some Saturdays tell me they know themselves. They are procrastinators. If they did not have to show up every Saturday, they would put off doing their homework to the last minute. So, you know, know thyself, know what works with your personal and social schedules um, and your, your learning style. It's not that different, a little bit different in terms of work experience, but not that much. 
Yeah, that's great. Great advice. Um, we have only about one minute and we want to be respectful of everyone's time, but I thought we might end with um, kind of a fun question. There was some folks wondering about the kind of social or networking aspects of the program. I think you guys may have touched on it a little bit already, but given that you're only meeting um, either officially required either once a week or every other week, how did what kind of examples of social or networking events outside the classroom um, were significant to you in your experience? I know you guys had a different experience because a lot of it was virtual because of the pandemic, but maybe that last semester you made up different. for it all? <laughs> I don't think so either. If anything, the pandemic, may, well, the, the, the pandemic might have brought us closer together because there was, you know, we were we were under this sort of rigorous COVID testing regime where we, were you know largely trusting each other and and um, and in, in, you know in the classroom together. So hanging out afterwards was was easy. I've heard from people in more recent classes than ours even that um, you know that they hang out a little less than we did because the um, their work social obligations or their normal life social obli obligations are are heavier. But you know you name it, we probably did it like. Uh, it, the early in the program, it sort of starts with networking, and then trips, and then weekends, and you know weddings, et cetera, et cetera. Like the, uh, you know, it's 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 life altering, I think, in 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 that way. Where again, you start out as classmates, and, and by and large, by the end, you are just friends. Yeah, that's right. And I would say even now, I think people do a great job of staying in touch and getting together. So it definitely extends beyond the life of the program, too. Great. Well, I, I want to thank um, I want to thank everyone who tuned in for joining us. But I really want to thank, uh, of course, Yasmin, but Phoebe and Austin, thank you for taking time out of your day to be here. So let's do a little virtual applause for them.